everyone. Uh, hello to, uh, to everyone in Rickerton, as well as uh, to those out there um, watching through Zoom. Um, I was planning to uh, be um, in Rickerton live with um, everyone, but um, unfortunately, there are some circumstances out of my control that uh, prevented uh, me from coming in. So um, better remote than um, not um, doing this presentation at all. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. And uh, as Mitch says, um, 60 Minutes in Space is our monthly uh, presentation about the latest space news. And typically, as an astronomer, I don't cover um, things inside of our solar system. But because um, this event um, was so momentous, and um, probably um, many of you, if not most of you, um, had heard about this, I thought I should um, talk about the DART mission. And uh, DART, um, as you can see, stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And basically, um, the reason why um, NASA funded this mission is that um, there are hazardous asteroids out there in our solar system. And we know of um, about 25,000 asteroids whose orbits um, could conceivably um, cross um, Earth's orbit. And, uh, they're, um, you know, and these are um, objects um, about 500 feet wide or larger. Um, and, but we think that we've only discovered about a third of them. And so um, the danger uh, from an asteroid impact is very real. Um, about um, nine years ago, um, over Russia, um, over the city of Chelyabinsk, a, an asteroid about 60 feet um, entered the atmosphere and, uh, and exploded and um, caused widespread damage over um, six cities in Russia. And so we know um, um, historically, um, small and large asteroids are a danger to our planet. And so um, there has been um, quite a lot of interest in trying to um, find all the dangerous asteroids and then also to test technologies um, to help deflect asteroids um, that may be on a collision course in the future. And so this uh, is what DART does. And it's a mission um, sent out um, to um, the asteroid Didymos, um, which actually has a small moon around it um, called Dimorphos. And the idea, as you can see in this diagram, um, there's DART um, at the bottom. Um, and there's also um, another um, smaller um, satellite called Lycia Cube, which um, breaks away um, from the main spacecraft. And um, when DART collides, um, it's that smaller CubeSat that will be beaming back um, images from um, from the collision, and um, and so the uh, the Dimorphos um, orbits in, in about 12 hours um, from um, or once every orbit around um, Didymos, and um, it's what what um, astronomers called a uh, an eclipsing binary, and what that means is that the uh, the orbit of um, Didymos um, goes or Dimorphos goes um, directly in front of Didymos. And so um, even though it's um, uh, Dimorphos is so small that you can't actually you can see it, it yeah, through um, a, a telescope, you can actually watch the, um, the light change. And so from that, you can actually measure um, what its um, orbital period is. And yeah. if we change the period um, of the um, orbit by impacting a, a spacecraft on it, we can actually measure that as well. And so here is a, um, uh, kind of a, a cartoon showing how big um, the main asteroid is. So you can see it's about um, slightly um, smaller than the height of the Burj Khalifa, which is the tallest building on Earth. And, um, and even though uh, Mitch says the um, asteroid we're trying to hit is pretty tiny, it's still um, larger than the football field. So it's about 500 feet across. Now, part of the problem is that um, you know, even um, at the point of impact, this asteroid um, pair will still be about um, 7 million uh, miles um, away um, from the Earth. And what that means is that the light travel time is on the order of about half a minute. And so there's really no way for controllers on Earth to steer the spacecraft. And so once it um, gets um, within um, range, there um, is something called um, an autonomous navigation system that actually takes over and, uh, and, and that is the system that steers um, and um, um, gets this uh, spacecraft on a trajectory to collide with uh, Dimorphos. 
And um, here is uh, some um, schematics of the spacecraft. You can see that um, there's solar panels that actually roll out and deploy. And there's something called the Draco Imager. Um, there's an arrow pointing to it um, up on the um, right um, image. And that's the camera um, that's used to, uh, to take images of the asteroid and help um, steer the spacecraft um, to its impact point. Um, here is, um, on the left is kind of a, um, uh, a rendering of what that camera um, looks like. It's actually based on the LORI camera, the long range reconnaissance imager camera that was uh, put on board the um, New Horizons um, spacecraft that was sent uh, to Pluto. So um, one of the ways they kept the mission costs down was to use tried and um, tested technology. And, um, and then the um, image on the right, um, you can actually see um, that camera on that stand and they're lowering the uh, main spacecraft body to attach it. So uh, this uh, picture also gives you a sense of how big the spacecraft is. So it's really not that big compared to the people around it. Um, there's also, um, like I said earlier, there's um, actually a secondary spacecraft. And this is one is built by the Italian Space Agency. And uh, this was uh, launched um, uh, while the um, spacecraft, um, I, I think, is uh, on the order of maybe a month um, out from, from impact. And so it uh, basically follows along and it's all, um, relaying um, images back to Earth um, from um, DART, as well as sending back pictures of its own. So uh, here is a spacecraft um, being put into a shipping container that will then get um, sent to Vandenberg um, Space Force Base in California. And it was launched last summer um, um, from California on board a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. And let's um, watch the impact. Signal. <laughs> I think so. I think we're starting to see more, uh, more resolution. In fact, look at that. Didymos has even gone out of the view. We're now just seeing Dimorphos. This is remarkable stuff. Oh my goodness, look at that. Looks like control system settling down, angular rates look really good. I think we're gonna get the investigation team some good pictures. Wow. No, no, come on, we can do better than that. <laughs> oh. Starting to see those individual boulders there. You can see shadows uh, of the various rocks on the surface. It's amazing, guys. Oh my goodness, look at that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Looks to me like we're headed straight in. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Eight, yeah. Seven, oh, six, wow. five, four, three, two, one. Oh my gosh. Oh wow. Awaiting visual confirmation. All right. We got it? Waiting. Waiting. And we have Every impact. <laughs> we found the personality in the name of planetary defense. Woo. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Oh. What, what a moment. Very few words can really capture this moment. This is beautiful to watch. <laughs> All right, so that occurred uh, just this past Monday. Um, the impact um, happened um, just after 5 p.m. Uh, mountain time, so um, after 7 p.m. Eastern time. And um, here are some of the images that were um, returned. Um, and so um, here um, is an image showing the dual um, binary um, um, asteroid um, system. And um, here is um, a, um, a composite image um, just showing how much detail um, that they were getting um, from um, the spacecraft um, as it was plunging down um, towards the surface. And, um, and you know, NASA likes to test new technologies on every mission, and this was um, just showing just how well that autonomous uh, navigation system worked because you know, it, um, it was targeting something, um, and, and the spacecraft itself was moving just under four miles uh, per second towards 
um, its target. So, um, you know, and the, um, many times um, faster than the speed of sound and the fact that they were able to hit it um, so well, it just speaks to um, how well um, the systems worked. And um, here is uh, an image from the um, Italian uh, CubeSat um, showing uh, the debris cloud um, that is erupting from uh, Didymos um, or, or Dimorphos. I keep getting the, um, the two names confused. And, um, and then here are um, additional um, images. And um, there were a whole host of um, telescopes on Earth as well as in space, including the James Webb Space Telescope um, that were pointed at this. And, um, and um, there was um, some speculation early on about what the results are uh, or coming out of this um, experiment. But um, I think uh, we, we probably will have to wait a few months before um, some d definitive uh, results um, come back. So uh, stay tuned um, as far as what um, we will learn from this particular mission. All right, so uh, I'm going to now um, jump on to our next story. And um, to do that, I want to show um, this um, pretty famous um, part of the sky. Uh, many of you um, are familiar with this. This is the uh, what uh, people have called the Pillars of Creation in the um, M16 or Eagle uh, Nebula. And this is a uh, Hubble Space Telescope image. And uh, this image has driven um, a lot of people's imaginations about um, how spectacular um, space imagery can be. But um, you know, one of the um, really interesting questions that astronomers like to ask is, um, why um, do we see structures like this um, in interstellar space? And what we are seeing um, are basically um, remnants of a large molecular gas cloud. And um, so you see that um, cloud in the, um, in the dark um, nebulous um, regions in the, um, that show up as the three pillars. Uh, but there are also um, lots of stars around it, and there are even stars embedded um, inside um, this cloud. And you also see um, a lot of um, glowing um, gas, and um, that glow is coming from um, the UV radiation from massive stars that are ionizing the gas and lighting up this region. And this region um, is a place where um, stars are being born. So um, the stars are born out of um, giant ga um, gas clouds that collapse. And, um, and we're seeing the remnants of those clouds because um, once massive stars um, are formed, those massive stars start blasting away um, the surrounding gas. And they uh, basically destroy the cloud from within. And so um, the beautiful structures that you see are basically the leftover remnants of um, the, the cloud that used to be there. And the reason why we're able to see um, into this cloud is because um, a lot of that um, gas and dust has been evaporated away um, by the energetic radiation and the winds from the stars, from the young stars. So um, that's kind of the basic uh, picture that explains, um, or the basic um, story that explains what we're seeing here. Um, in addition to observations, um, astronomers also like to create um, models, or um, in many cases, very sophisticated computer simulations to, uh, to show these uh, phenomena and mechanisms that, that I've just described um, at work. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run um, a simulation that's um, uh, coming from a group um, that calls themselves um, StarForge, um, which stands for Star Formation in gaseous environments. And this is a simulation showing how a gas cloud collapses. Um, so you're starting with about 20,000 solar masses, so 20,000 times the mass of our sun's worth of gas. And, um, and we're um, seeing stars forming um, in dense parts of the cloud. Um, the gas collapse, collapses to form stars. And what happens is that um, even the not so massive stars, um, the infalling gas, gets um, interacts um, with magnetic fields around uh, very close to the protostars. And much of that gas actually gets um, ejected outwards in bipolar jets. And so that's what you see um, those orange um, sort of things shooting out um, along the polar directions of young stars are. And uh, we're um, sort of turning around, but I think, um, Okay, it's going to keep going, but um, and I think I have another um, animation um, coming up as well. Um, 
But um, so the, um, and then you can see um, round, um, um, white, whitish dots, those correspond to the young stars um, that are formed. And, um, and, and so um, in addition to infall, there's also a lot of disruptive um, energetic outflows from these um, young stars. And um, the, this, um, over the past um, four or five months, this team has come out with a whole series of papers, and uh, the last one just came out this past month, where um, they're um, going over a lot of um, the, the physics and the astrophysics um, that they've learned from this particular simulation. And what you'll see um, now is um, we'll, we'll see another version of that animation. And um, so, um, so what we're um, seeing is um, millions of years um, compressed into just a couple of minutes. And here again, you see um, these um, amazing outflows, these jets um, coming out, out in um, two directions, emanating um, from these um, young stars. And what's amazing again, is that uh, many of these stars um, are about the mass of our sun. So they don't have to be very massive um, to be sending out these powerful jets. And in some cases, you actually see pairs of jets um, coming out from the same location or jets that appear um, to be changing directions, sort of like if you're um, spraying water from a water hose and you start um, 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 pivoting your hand, you can see um, the jets um, kind of um, changing directions. Um, in the middle you, um, of the screen, um, you see um, two sort of spherical shells expanding out. Um, those are um, from massive stars that are just lighting up. And uh, those stars um, put out a huge amount of UV radiation. And so that UV radiation expands um, outward um, and um, compresses and it heats up the gas. And, um, and um, that hot gas um, that, um, that you've seen being ionized are the um, expanding shells. And over time, the UV radiation and the uh, power from these jets and at a certain point, we're also going to see um, a couple um, or a supernova going off. Um, they basically disrupt the cloud from the inside. And so you can sort of see that there are um, two processes at work. So you have gravity that pulls the gas inwards towards these young stars um, and it builds up the stars. And then at the same time, um, the winds and the jets and the radiation from these stars are blowing the cloud apart. And um, and we've um, kind of frozen, um, but you can sort of see a very rich um, cluster of stars at the center of, um, of this cluster. And um, let's see how far in time we are. Um, I guess we're still not quite um, towards the end where we're going to see a supernova, but, um, but um, just wait because it's coming up. Um, and one of the uh, discoveries that they made in this simulation is that um, oftentimes um, you'll have actually multiple um, mini clusters of stars, but over time through gravitational interactions, um, at least in, in, in this particular model, um, the stars um, will wander um, and uh, migrate um, until uh, they um, sort of end up around um, a, a more central um, cluster. Um, and so that's why you have uh, most of the stars um, kind of ending up um, towards the middle of this cluster. And then over time, um, as more and more um, gas gets expelled from this gas cloud, um, the cloud becomes unbound. And what that means is that the gravity of the gas and the gravity between the stars um, is no longer enough to hold everything together. And so once all the gas is, um, or most of the gas is, is expelled away, the, um, this cluster basically uh, breaks apart. And so the stars are, will no longer be bound by gravity. And so they'll slowly wander away from each other and then basically spread out um, into um, the rest of our galaxy. All right, I think we're getting close to um, the, the supernova, unless I missed it. But um, we're definitely coming to the end of the, uh, the the star formation um, cloud. And so you can see that um, there's not much gas left anymore, um, but um, what you have left over is a nice, uh, beautiful um, young um, star cluster. There we go, there's that supernova. And so uh, the blast from that supernova, basically um, in this simulation, wipes out much of the rest of the gas. So the momentum from the blast wave 
um, pushes um, a lot of the gas away and, um, and it dissipates the cloud. And then so over time, um, there won't be much left. Um, you can, and I think they stopped the simulation after about um, 8 million years, but you can imagine that over time, um, the continued radiation and winds from these stars will uh, basically break apart what's left of the cloud and then the stars uh, will um, wander away. All right, here is um, one other video um, from that um, group. And uh, what they've done is taken uh, that simulation and then um, looked at the, um, the light that would be emitted uh, from um, sulfur um, atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms, or actually in this case, ions of those atoms, meaning um, electrons have been stripped from these atoms. And as a result, once they've been ionized, um, they can release light. And um, so um, the, the reason why they chose those particular um, species is that um, those are um, the exact same species that have um, often been used um, in Hubble Space Telescope images to um, when, when astronomers pick particular filters uh, to take um, their images in, um, they uh, often pick um, those filters covering um, hydrogen, sulfur, and, and oxygen ions. And so um, this particular um, animation basically shows you what um, a Hubble um, Space Telescope um, sort of image of this region might uh, be like if, um, if this was real as opposed to a computer simulation. So you can see that um, they're able to reproduce a lot of the features um, that we see in a lot of the famous Hubble um, Space Telescope images that we've seen over the years, including the pillars of creation in M16. And you can see a lot of um, structures that um, kind of look like um, those pillars. So these are uh, reg uh, regions of gas that are denser than other regions. And so the radiation and the winds have kind of excavated out around the pillars and they've left behind some of these denser um, pillars. And, um, but over time, um, you would expect um, the, the winds and the radiation um, from the stars to eventually wipe away um, everything that's remaining. All right, so with that, I'm gonna, um, we're, we're gonna see more examples of this um, a little bit later um, in our presentation, but we're gonna go on to um, talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. And um, um, James Webb, um, was launched uh, last December, um, Christmas Day of 2021. And uh, it's been um, um, over uh, the course of several months, it w underwent this very complicated deployment scheme and um, everything um, has checked out and is pretty much working as planned. And um, there have been a number of um, images that have been released to the public. And I know um, some of our past speakers to 60 Minutes in Space have talked about them over the past couple months. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the ones that um, they haven't talked about. Um, but as a reminder, the James Webb is um, our, our newest and um, greatest um, observatory um, that we've launched into space. Um, the, um, it's um, better in the sense that um, it has a much larger mirror than the Hubble Space Telescope. And for astronomers, um, the mirror size is extremely important because the larger the mirror, the more light you can collect and um, that means you can look at much fainter uh, objects um, in the sky. And so Hubble has a mirror that's about two and a half meters in diameter, and uh, James Webb is about six meters. Um, so it has much uh, more um, collecting area uh, uh, than, um, than Hubble. And um, here is just a comparison of, of the two. Um, James Webb doesn't look that much bigger, but um, the the, um, it, the much of it is taken up by the uh, the large um, heat shield at the bottom, and so normally people talk about James Webb um, if you include that heat shield as being about the size of a tennis court. So it gives you a rough idea of, of how big it is. Um, Hubble, um, on the other hand, um, you can think of as being the size of a um, good size um, school bus. So um, as far as um, what um, James Webb is designed to do, it's um, designed to look in the um, infrared. And one of the, um, the reasons why you want to do that is, um, is when you look out into the universe, especially at very distant galaxies, because the universe is expanding, the light from um, distant galaxies the, um, actually gets stretched out by the expansion of the universe. 
And so one of the goals of James Webb is to look at some of the earliest galaxies and earliest stars that formed after the Big Bang and light that we um, would be able to see with our eyes or even light in the ultraviolet can, can actually be shifted or um, lengthened um, the wavelengths stretched out into the infrared. And so you really need an infrared telescope to be able to see that. And um, I, um, this slide should actually have been before that, but um, here you can see um, the, the range of the Hubble Space Telescope. It operates mostly in the visible part of the spectrum, so light that our eyes are sensitive to. Um, it, um, Hubble also looks slightly into the ultraviolet and slightly into the um, what we call the near infrared. But James Webb looks entirely at the near and um, what scientists call the mid infrared. And, um, and the reason why, um, another reason why I'm going into the infrared is really important is that you can actually see um, through gas and dust clouds. So the image on the left is um, an image um, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope and it's a, a nebula, uh, part of the nebula in um, Carina. And so you can see a lot of um, cloud um, and, and glass gas structures like we were seeing before, um, where star formation is taking place. There are massive stars that are etching away the gas in this region. And, uh, and this is the visible light image. Now the image on the right is the same exact same uh, field, but this is now in the infrared. And you can even see that their um, stars line up. So these two bright stars correspond to those two bright stars. And uh, this star here corresponds to that one there. But you can also see that there are lots and lots of um, stars that weren't visible in the visible light image. And that's because infrared light um, are, uh, it, um, can pass through um, gas and dust clouds much more easily than visible light. Um, those gas clouds become much more transparent. And so you can um, basically look through a lot of the obscuration, uh, a lot of the muck that prevent you from seeing what's either inside a cloud or behind a uh, cloud of gas and dust. And um, you know, we um, saw um, in the animation earlier, um, jets coming out of young stars. And, and actually here is a jet right here. Um, and you can see a little bow shot where the jet is impacting the, um, the gas. So that's the jet up, up on the top of, of, of the image. All right, so, uh, so that's what um, James Webb um, allows us to do is to look through um, the, the, the gas clouds. So let's um, look at some examples of objects that, um, that James Webb has, has seen. And uh, the first um, one is a set of galaxies that's known as Stefan's um, Quintet. And, um, and Quintet means there are five. And, um, and you might think, well, um, there are only four galaxies, but actually, in fact, this um, is a pair of galaxies right in the center. So you can see there, there are two bright nuclei um, centers of the galaxy. And uh, th this pair of um, spiral galaxies are interacting, um, they're um, colliding, and the, um, the collision is resulting in um, tides that pull the, um, the spiral arms and stretching them out. And you can also see in the galaxy up top here that um, it's undergone um, a, an encounter um, that has also distorted its shape and, and caused a tidal tail to pull um, uh, the, the stars out. And uh, this galaxy here off to the left um, looks different from the other ones, and it is uh, because it's actually much closer. So this one, um, the nearby galaxy, is only about 40 million light years away, and the other ones are about 290 million light years. So when we look in um, with the Hubble Space Telescope, um, we can see lots of stars. Um, so um, you can see lots of bluish, um, whitish um, stars in the spiral arms of this galaxy. And you also see lots of um, reddish um, specks. And those reddish specks are regions of star formation. So those are places where um, there are um, clusters of stars being born in molecular clouds. Um, and they're lit up by the massive um, stars that are inside those clusters. And you might even notice that um, there are specks of red along um, this arc here as a result of um, those, that pair of colliding galaxies. So let's look at this um, with James Webb. And here is um, James Webb. And now um, things get a lot more complicated and I'm gonna just flash between these two so that um, you can sort of see what the two look like. And 
so for this galaxy where um, we saw the um, the stars um, show up in the spiral arms, you don't really see the spiral arms anymore, uh, but you do see this kind of orangish mess here. It looks like um, somebody just spilled um, a bunch of stuff on the ground. And, uh, and this emission um, is actually coming from um, the um, molecular um, gas that's in the cloud or in the galaxy. So these are the regions where, um, it, or that's the gas that um, stars um, can form out of. And then the same thing along here in kind of orange and red, you're seeing the gas that's distributed along this arc. And this arc, um, like I said earlier, was formed um, by the collision of these two galaxies where the gravity, uh, gravitational interaction is kind of uh, pushed out this gas. And then you can also see bright knots or bright regions um, that, that are like specks all along um, this arc. And if we um, jump back, you can see that they roughly correspond to those um, reddish star forming clusters that we saw in the Hubble image. So we're seeing um, intense regions of star formation happening um, along this arc. And you can imagine that um, not only the, these gas clouds get thrown out via that collision, but they also got compressed um, by um, tidal forces. And it's that compression that causes parts of the cloud to collapse to form stars. And so um, we think that um, star formation is kind of a natural um, process um, as uh, that, that, um, that ends up happening as a result of these um, collisions. And then if you look at this galaxy up here, you can see um, again, um, the orange um, and red kind of highlighting the, um, the gas clouds. And if we go back to the Hubble image, um, you, um, sort of see that in the dark regions here, but um, but you know, th um, these dark regions are an absence of light, whereas in the James Webb image, uh, the clouds themselves actually glow in the infrared, so you actually can see the clouds uh, much better. And then um, we can also go into, um, so that image was uh, taken in what's known as the near infrared, so the, the part of the infrared that's closest to the visible part of the spectrum, but if we go further out into the infrared, what we call the mid-infrared, um, James Webb sees, um, again, um, something slightly different. So again, the, um, the star forming regions light up. Um, they show uh, up um, sort of in um, purple um, or, or blue. And, um, and these are regions um, that are um, being heated up by the massive um, stars um, in the star forming regions. But um, you also see a lot of um, greenish um, gas. So, so you can see hints of green along here, there's hints of green over here, and hints of green up there. And that particular filter in the mid-infrared is actually sensitive to um, something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, which is a mouthful of a term. Um, astronomers like to call it um, the PAHs. And these are um, organic molecules. Now, they, um, even though they're organic, meaning they have carbon and hydrogen in them, they don't originate from life. Um, they're just known as organic because they have carbon. Um, but uh, these um, molecules are um, very com complicated and they form naturally in um, the atmospheres of, of stars and they collect in molecular clouds. And so um, James Webb can actually see these complex uh, molecules in the um, clouds of distant um, galaxies. All right, so let's go on to another galaxy. This is a very famous um, galaxy called the Cartwheel. And this is a, um, an image taken um, by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is um, a spiral galaxy that has undergone a collision with another galaxy. So instead of nice spiral arms, you have um, these weird spokes that come out from the center of the, of the galaxy. And there's a big ring around this galaxy that makes it look like a Cartwheel. And the reason why this galaxy is the shape uh, we think we understand how it formed uh, is uh, via a direct collision with another smaller galaxy. So this is a computer simulation. And what we're seeing are stars shown up here in the two um, animations. And the two bottom animations are showing the gas. And when you have a collision where one galaxy basically hits the other um, like a bullseye, it um, drives basically a giant pressure wave um, that um, goes outward and it uh, pushes out the stars and the gas 
um, and um, it pushes them um, into this um, you know, big wheel-like um, configuration. So this is you know, looking at it um, from two different um, angles. And you can see at, um, by the end of this animation, you're starting to get um, that cartwheel shape and you're even starting to get sort of these spokes um, showing up in the gas. And uh, there's still um, some hint of the spiral um, arm structure in the stars. And in fact, we think um, what happens with the spokes is that over time, they'll eventually evolve into um, spiral arms again. And um, so here um, is that Hubble image. And then we're going to switch to the James Webb. And in James Webb, you can see, again, lots of um, the red coming in um, that highlights the locations of the gas. So um, you know, here, it's not um, you're seeing light from the stars, but um, it's hard to get a sense of where the gas is. Here, you really see the gas um, lighting up. And you're also seeing a lot of um, spots where um, the gas is being um, heated by um, stellar clusters. And then now we're going to go from the near infrared to the um, uh, mid infrared. And again, we're seeing um, in, um, in blue a lot of the regions where um, stars um, we're seeing uh, mid infrared light um, from stars or uh, from gas heated up um, by the stars. And then we also see um, lots of um, tight um, little clusters um, showing where um, star formation is taking place. So again, um, you can imagine um, this wave of gas expanding outwards and compressing upon itself. And as it compresses, parts of that gas, um, those clouds collapse to form stars. And so that's why there are lots of little um, bright uh, pin spots along here where uh, immense amounts of star formation is taking place. All right, for um, my next image, um, I'm going to go down to the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, for um, those of, uh, for anyone who's been um, to the Southern Hemisphere, you know, whether um, it's in Africa or Australia, or South America, you know that um, the stars that you see are different um, and the constellations um, can be very different from what you experience in the Northern Hemisphere. And one of the um, more remarkable objects in the sky is the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. And this is an image of the Large Magellanic Cloud is taken from a ground, large ground-based um, telescope. And off to the um, upper left here is an extremely bright nebula called the Tarantula. And, um, and this is um, something that you, you can actually see with the naked eye. Um, so you can see the uh, large Magellanic cloud uh, from a dark spot um, with your naked eye. But um, if um, you're, you're at a sufficiently dark um, place, and if you let your eyes adjust, you can actually see the tarantula nebula itself. And it's something that I've done um, when I've traveled to South America. It's a pretty amazing sight. So you're basically looking at a nebula that's 160,000 light years away. Um, that's how far the Large Magellanic Cloud is. And here is um, a Hubble Space Telescope image. And again, this is another um, star forming region. And the Large Magellanic Cloud is full of these um, star forming sites, but the Tarantula Nebula is the most largest and most spectacular of them all. And in fact, it's the most spectacular star forming region that we know of in our local group of galaxies, or at least um, the ones that we can see. There might be um, something on the other side of our own galaxy um, that's hidden away and blocked by the gas and dust and um, stars in our own galaxy that we can't see. But so far, this is the most spectacular that we can see in any of the galaxies in our local group. And um, so again, um, you can see a dense cluster of stars. Um, and in fact, um, you now there are over, um, probably on the order of half a million young stars that have been formed um, in multiple um, clusters in the, the tarantula. So not only is there this one central cluster, which is known as R136, there's also something else up here uh, called Hodge 301 um, that's also very famous. And, um, and this is a Hubble Space Telescope image. And what we're going to do now is we're going to zoom in to the um, James Webb image that was also released uh, recently. So here we are. And so if you compare, again, let's jump back and forth, you can sort of see that there's a lot more um, obscuration, a lot more gas that's hiding the, the stars between, um, when you compare the Hubble to James Webb. So again, um, this is showing how James Webb can allow us to peer through a lot of the obscuring gas and dust um, in this region. 
And um, it's allowing us to really see, um, you know, not only the central cluster, but um, tens of thousands of other um, young stars um, that were uh, previously hidden by the gas and dust in this um, in, in the molecular cloud. And, uh, and this um, central cluster is absolutely jam packed with massive stars. Um, so there are over a thousand um, supermassive stars, each of them putting out um, at least 100,000 times, if not a million times, the uh, light and energy um, as our sun puts out. And it's the light and radiation and the winds from these massive stars that are just blowing a hole in this nebula um, and, and blowing a hole in this gas cloud that's creating uh, the nebula. And then finally, there's um, here's an image in the mid infrared. And, um, and in the blue, um, you're actually seeing um, kind of emission from the edges of the cloud um, that are being lit up by the, um, by the massive stars. And so you, again, get a sense of these stars um, whose winds and whose um, ultraviolet radiation is basically blowing apart the cloud. And these structures here are analogous to uh, the pillars of creation that we saw um, earlier and those pillars that we saw in the um, in the computer simulation, so uh, so it's all really amazing stuff. But it's um, stuff that um, we we have a pretty good understanding of. But I'm sure astronomers um, will be um, going through um, these images and the data to help us um, learn exactly um, you know, how a lot of these processes um, are working at, um, at 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 a fine scale. Right, so here, um, this is nebula um, outside of our galaxy. Next, um, we're going to look at the Carina Nebula, which is inside of our own Milky Way. It's located um, just over 8,000 um, light years away. Um, and uh, in this particular um, image um, is about um, two degrees by two degrees um, in size. And so that's equivalent to about 16 full moons. So this is actually a pretty large um, part of the sky. Um, obviously, um, if you um, were able to see this, uh, this is in the Carina Nebula, which is um, pretty far um, south, so it's, it's barely visible uh, from the northern hemisphere. Um, but um, you, uh, it's only with a um, good telescope and uh, long exposures do you get um, an image as spectac spectacular as this. But we're actually going to zoom in to this nebula up in the top um, corner. And this nebula is called NGC 3324. And um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to zoom into just this region off to the right. So you can see that there's like a knob here. Um, it looks like um, one of these pillars. Um, astronomers like to call them elephant trunks. Um, and uh, there's also um, what we can sort of think of as a bay um, off to uh, to to the um, top of the um, of the pillar. And uh, this is an image taken from the um, Hubble Space Telescope. And so um, we're um, kind of turned on its side. And here is that knob or elephant trunk. And here's that long bay again. And again, you can kind of imagine this is the edge of um, a molecular cloud. And there um, is gas that's basically being boiled off um, by the radiation and the winds from the massive stars that are um, up um, and above um, this, the edge of this image. And um, even in this image, you can um, sort of see that there's um, activity. Um, it's kind of hard to see uh, from far away, but when you blow this up, you can um, get a sense that there's activity in the cloud. And so what we're going to do now is, is we're going to look at the James Webb Space Telescope image. So um, kind of uh, remember what, where we are. We have the knob, we have the bay, there's another peak here, and then there's um, something going on just to the right of this peak. And so here is um, the James Webb image. So here's the knob, here's the big bay, here's the peak. And here's the part that I kept pointing to in the Hubble image. And you can see that traced out in yellow, you can see bow shocks. So th these look like exactly the same sort of bow shocks that we're seeing in the very first set of computer animations uh, much earlier in, in the talk tonight, um, where um, we saw um, jets um, shooting out from young stars. And so this is an example of a jet um, smashing into the molecular gas that's inside the cloud. And with James Webb, we're actually able to see through the obscuring gas 
and see the glow from the jet, or actually uh, from the jet smashing into the uh, the cloud and creating these uh, bow shocks. And then here you can see another bow shock over here, originating from probably this star because it kind of lines up with it. And um, and there are probably lots of other um, jet-like structures um, that will show up if you examine the um, the full resolution image. But um, you can just see just how many uh, more stars um, are visible when you compare Hubble to James Webb. So, um, so we're, um, James Webb is allowing us to see just some amazing um, details and um, things that we would not be able to see in uh, visible or optical light. And finally, here is the uh, mid-infrared view. And um, here again is um, that jet um, and with that double bow shock. And, um, and then here you can see some um, really dark structures. And so um, these are parts of the cloud that are so dense that uh, we can't uh, view them even in the mid-infrared. So these are interesting places to investigate further because there might be um, stars or other objects hidden. You can actually even see, um, and those of you at um, in Rickardson in the back, you might not see, there's, but there's a tiny red dot right where I'm circling with my cursor, and that looks like an embedded young star that's really deeply embedded. All right, so um, in my final minutes, I'm gonna talk about um, the um, very famous um, James Webb image, which was the very first one that was released. Um, they did a big announcement with um, the White House, uh, with uh, President Biden involved. And uh, so this is um, that cluster as seen from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this doesn't look as spectacular as the James Webb image uh, because it was never uh, processed to the point um, to be as nice um, as the James Webb one. And, um, and you can see that there, um, Hubble did um, use multiple filters, including in the infrared. Um, and so that's why um, it looks um, kind of um, um, like there's missing information and that's just because um, along the edges and that's just because um, the images taken at different filters weren't quite aligned, but you can sort of see that there's good alignment um, in the center. And then the James Webb view is basically um, what we're going to see here. And so let's switch to the James Webb view. And many of you um, have probably seen this um, already. And what we're looking at is a um, cluster of um, galaxies that's um, located about 4 billion light years away. Um, so or, so that, what that means is that, that the light um, took um, over four and a half billion years to travel to us. So basically um, the age of, the, of our solar system and of planet Earth. And uh, this was the result of about 12 and a half hours of exposure with James Webb, but this is actually a really tiny patch of sky. So this is equivalent um, to um, if you took a grain of sand and if you held it at arm's length, and imagine how big that grain of sand will look to you. That's how big of a part of sky uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is looking at. And this is um, so far the deepest image of the universe yet. And what you can imagine we're seeing is um, we're basically looking at a pencil beam um, or a straw that stretches out uh, four and a half billion years and, and, and actually even further. And so there are galaxies all along this narrow pencil beam um, the main cluster is at four and a half billion light years away, but there are galaxies that are closer and there are galaxies that are further away. And the, the central cluster, and so there are um, lots of galaxies kind of um, in the center, as well as um, blobs, um, kind of um, biggish blobs that are all kind of centrally um, located. There are um, also stars. You can see um, bright um, diffraction spikes coming from stars in our own galaxy. But beyond um, the few dozen stars, every single um, other object in this picture are galaxies. But the, um, the galaxy cluster is so massive that the gravity from this cluster acts like a lens. And it actually creates these distortions. You can see these arcs that show up all through the image. And again, uh, for those of you in Rickinson, you might want to move closer to be able to see not only the big arcs, but um, there are actually dozens of smaller arcs all around. And so the gravity of this cluster acts like a lens. And what it does is it magnifies images of much more distant galaxies. So galaxies that you um, will be much harder to observe because they're so much further away and they would appear much smaller. Um, their images um, can get um, not only be distorted, but they can be magnified. And sometimes you might even see multiple versions of them. So, um, 
So we're going to be um, talking about um, some examples of those. But before we get to that, I want to um, talk about um, some um, what are called red spiral galaxies that was just announced in um, this uh, preprint. Um, so this is a paper that was submitted for uh, peer review. It ha hasn't been published yet, meaning there could still be changes um, based on um, recommendations from um, uh, reviewers. But um, what um, the, this Japanese team did was they went and looked at three galaxies in the um, in this uh, particular region, and these are galaxies that are further away than the main cluster. And you can see that um, they also look um, pretty red, and so um, that's what we mean by the red spirals in the title of the paper. And just to give you a comparison of how. Um, well, um, James Webb does its job as far as resolving these galaxies. The, um, the only other um, really good um, infrared um, space telescope, um, or the last infrared space telescope that we've had up there is Spitzer, and it had a much smaller uh, mirror, and as a result, the, those three galaxies look like um, just a bunch of, um, a handful of pixels, but um, they um, resolve into um, not only the galaxies, but you can also see even more distant galaxies um, in um, each of these um, three images. Um, this uh, object here in, um, in the top part of the left image is, is a star in our own galaxy. And um, so, th so these are clearly um, spiral galaxies, because you can see spiral arms. But what's really interesting about them is that they look very, very red. And that um, is very unusual, because spiral galaxies tend to be uh, very blue. And so here, are um, images taken from the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey. And, um, and so the top images are what typical um, spiral galaxies look like. Uh, they, tend to, uh, they do tend to have kind of a reddish or yellowish um, core, and that's because there tend to be older stars at the very center, um, of the bulges in these spiral galaxies. But the spiral arms um, are places where star formation takes place, and so that's where you expect to see um, young stars um, and massive stars. And um, those stars tend to be uh, bluish. And so they uh, cause the, um, the spiral arms and the disk of the spiral galaxies to, to tend to be uh, blue. But uh, in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, they did find um, red spirals. Um, and they're red in the sense that um, they don't really have um, many blue stars. And so you tend to have um, orangish um, light coming from older stars, and there tend not to be that much in the way of new star formation. Uh, but um, we, we find um, only about 6% um, of um, relatively nearby um, galaxies um, or um, reddish um, spirals. But what's really interesting is that in um, this um, particular James Webb um, view direction, um, they're, they're finding um, red spirals um, pretty easily. And, um, and here is one of them. And the way that they've analyzed this is they've looked at the, the light from different filters, and they created a um, computer model of the stellar populations. And so the, uh, the purple points with the error bars are the measurements taken from um, James Webb, along with other telescopes. And uh, these points are um, sort of maximum values based on non-James Webb um, telescopes. And then this red line is a model where they model the uh, types of stars that could be in uh, this galaxy. And they're, I mean, as you can see, they, um, they do a good job modeling it. But uh, from this model, uh, they're able to determine that um, this galaxy is about um, at least 10 billion light years away um, when the light was emitted. Um, and then they uh, did the same for all three um, galaxies. And so, um, and what they find is that these are some of the most uh, distant galaxies, most distant spirals that we know of. So at least um, 10 billion um, light years away. And they correspond to um, a part of cosmic history that astronomers call cosmic noon. Um, so um, after the um, stars, the first stars, and after the first galaxies have turned on, and, um, and this is kind of the, um, point where we expect star formation to be um, at a maximum. But what's really interesting here is that we're finding galaxies where star formation is turned off. So um, they had maximum star formation earlier, prior to um, this, the time that we're observing them. Um, and now we hardly see any um, bluish light at all um, coming from um, young stars. And so most of the stars in these galaxies 
or from older stars. So, um, so there's little star formation happening, and that is very interesting for people studying um, the history of our universe and studying how galaxies evolve. All right, so let's um, end our presentation with one last paper, and uh, this is um, about uh, something called the sparkler, um, which is <laughs> kind of a, a really cool name. And uh, this is, is, again, coming from that same um, image uh, in James Webb, and you can see that there are, um, we're zoomed in and we're looking at um, regions one, two, and three. And when we um, zoom in, here's one, two, and three. And so this is a star, um, this bluish thing, and you have to ignore that. But what we're looking at um, is this um, hot dog blob off um, behind it. And you can see these blobs um, also have bright specks along um, around the, uh, the central blob. And so, um, so these specks are called um, sparkles. And what um, we think the astronomers um, think we might be seeing are um, globular clusters. So globular clusters um, we know of as uh, being clusters of um, very old clusters of stars around our Milky Way. And we see them um, in other nearby galaxies. And this might be the, uh, some of the furthest um, globular clusters that have ever been observed. And, um, and, and so these are um, those three um, images, um, regions again. This is region one, this is region two, and region three. And we've seen um, those different um, sparkles. And uh, in this uh, particular um, set of images in the middle, they're um, using a filter that is sensitive to oxygen three. And so this is sensitive to star forming region. So they are seeing uh, regions associated with these sparkles that have lots of star formation taking place. And by using um, something called a color-color uh, magnitude um, diagram. I'm not going to explain how this works, but um, they can basically place these sparkles into different positions in um, this particular diagram. And so the sparkles that are in the top of the diagram, they um, call the red and dead section. And so these are um, star clusters that um, tend to be red um, and they don't have very much star formation. And so um, they um, are um, quiescent or dead um, is another way to describe it. And then um, the, the ones at the bottom um, tend to have active um, star formation. They tend to be bluer. And so um, what we're seeing are um, some of the earliest globular clusters. And, and these are um, clusters that are showing up um, about 4 billion um, years after the Big Bang. And, um, and for them, um, for the ones that are red and dead up here, uh, for them um, to um, have ended star formation, it's thought that um, star formation might have started in them perhaps 500 million years in, um, after the Big Bang. And so this would have been the time when the very first stars were first turning on. So even in this very first you know, magnificent James Webb Space Telescope um, image, um, this deep image, we're seeing some of the earliest um, star clusters and um, perhaps evidence for some of the earliest stars in the universe. So that's it. pretty amazing uh, for the very first image that was released to the public. So with that, um, I've um, taken um, the full hour. And, um, and for those of you who have to leave, um, I, I know, um, you, um, you know, feel free to, um, uh, to um, take off if you need to, but I um, am happy to uh, hang around and answer um, questions until Mitch kicks me off. All right, and we do have some questions already. Um, <clears throat> just starting with the latest one, do the visual artifacts from JWST's hexagonal mirrors make it difficult to measure or model images? Yeah, that's a really good question. So let's go back to... Um, um, this image, and um, and that, so you can see that um, around each of the stars, there's um, these um, six uh, lines, these diffraction spikes, and there's also um, a horizontal um, set of diffraction spikes that come out as well that aren't as bright. And these are um, these spikes um, are things that you cannot get rid of. They are a fund fundamental part of the optical pathway. Um, of the telescope. And it has to do with the shape of the mirrors. It has to do with um, struts um, that hold up the secondary mirror. And so every telescope has its own very unique pattern that imposes itself onto single point sources. 
So even though um, we're looking at stars, you know, stars, um, even the closest stars um, look um, like points to us in even the largest telescopes. But what happens is that point source um, bouncing um, and being, um, with its light being collected by a telescope and with the light being bounced around uh, before uh, it gets to a detector, um, that, that single point uh, gets imprinted onto this diffraction pattern. And the, these diffraction patterns basically show up if you have a very bright source. So um, the galaxies themselves, um, the light sources do have that same diffraction pattern, but because they're much fainter than the stars, you can't see those patterns. Um, so these patterns are everywhere, but some of them are brighter than others. And, um, and the um, James Webb um, team, the scientists as well as the engineering team, um, I am sure are very busy um, modeling and um, creating observations to figure out exactly what um, these diffraction patterns um, are. Um, you know, once the telescope is in orbit, you, you can of course model that or observe that on the ground, but you need to know um, what it is once it's up in, into space. And so if you can model it really carefully, you can basically subtract out um, that pattern if you um, know um, information about the, um, the stars that are emitting that light. So there are definitely ways uh, for uh, them to get rid of um, some of those patterns so that um, you, um, you can um, you know, subtract out the effects and, um, and get a, a cleaner signal. Now, in some cases, um, some of these stars might be oversaturated um, or um, overexposed, in which case um, there might not be, uh, you might not be able to completely subtract out the very central core. But I think, um, you know, except for the very cores of, um, of the very bright stars, they, they probably can uh, do a good job of um, doing subtraction on the rest of the spikes. Okay, I am not hearing Charlotte, so Mitch, you, you're going to have to uh, relay the question. Okay, that was a great question. Uh, and basically, what's the potential for discovery with the James Webb Space Telescope? Okay, so um, uh, I think uh, you know, pretty much every uh, field of astronomy and planetary science um, has the potential to be revolutionized. Um, you know, um, when we look at the history of astronomy, every single new telescope um, that we built on the ground or put up into space or every new instrument that does something, you know, radically new um, or expands our horizon in a way that um, we weren't able to, you know, see some, um, a particular part of the spectrum or we weren't able to detect something that was too faint, um, you know, in pretty much every field of astronomy or every discipline of astronomy, planetary science, we always find new discoveries. So, um, you know, we've only talked about um, so far tonight discoveries um, in um, distant galaxies and um, star formation, but I think, um, you know, you'll um, have discoveries in um, pretty much any field of astronomy that you can think of, whether it's um, planets in our solar system or um, black holes or um, evolution of stars or um, stellar clusters or how galaxies um, collide. Um, it's um, hard, or, or um, planets around other stars. Um, it's uh, hard to imagine there won't be a field that um, won't be impacted in a really powerful way. Okay, so the question is, um, what do uh, the images look like um, now? Is that the question? Yeah, let's um, go back and look at um, this image again. So like I said, um, the um, we're, the cluster itself is uh, four and a half billion. Um, we're seeing light emitted four and a half billion years ago, and uh, the stars or galaxies that are even further away um, had their light emitted even further back in time. And what we do know is that galaxies do evolve over time. Um, so um, galaxies um, can collide, like we saw in Stefan's Quintet, and in cl rich clusters like this, where you see thousands of galaxies all gravitationally interacting with each other, you can expect lots of collisions, and those collisions will scramble the stars in galaxies, um, although over time what happens is um, galaxies um, gobble up or cannibalize um, other um, smaller galaxies. 
And so um, if you were to look at this particular cluster um, today, as opposed to um, four and a half billion years ago in the past, you probably will see a very distant clusters, um, a cluster where um, there are larger galaxies uh, now and uh, probably fewer galaxies because the larger ones have gobbled up um, the smaller ones. And that um, will also be the case uh, for uh, the more distant galaxies. And um, in every um, single deep field that we've looked at um, from um, the Hubble Space Telescope, when we look at very distant galaxies, we also notice that the more distant the galaxy is, uh, the more distorted their shapes are. And those are, um, that's evidence that they're undergoing collisions or they've um, had close encounters with other galaxies. So we know that uh, these collisions do um, tend to occur more frequently in the past. And so we think that, again, over time, a galaxy that looks super distorted in the past because of a near pass or, 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 a, uh, or a collision, um, it's probably settled down um, now once you kind of sped up time to the present because there are a few thing, fewer things for it uh, to collide with. Regarding DART, how much force was emitted uh, or was transferred to the asteroid and how long will it take to find out if they've made the one degree change? That I do not know um, as far as how much uh, force um, I would have to, um, I mean, I guess that's easy enough um, to calculate the amount of um, kinetic energy if you know um, what the relative speed of uh, the spacecraft um, was before it collided and the mass, but I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but um, I expect, um, you know, the people, um, you know, there were multiple telescopes, um, not only in space, but on the ground that were looking at it. And so I expect um, the mission scientists um, are busy um, working with their collaborators all around the world, getting all that data um, from the ground as well as from space. Yeah, um, the James Webb Space Telescope was involved in looking at it as well. And so um, in the coming weeks and months, um, we'll probably start hearing press releases about um, what, uh, the, how that impact ch um, might have changed or might not have changed the orbit of Dimorphos. Okay, so regarding DART, you said that at some point the spacecraft becomes autonomous, and how does it do that? How does it describe, decide its flight pattern? Yeah, that's something that um, I'm, I'm not an expert on as far as how, um, what exactly um, it's doing, but I, um, but I know that um, it's basically within the last 30 or 60 minutes uh, before collision. Um, well, the last 30 minutes because, definitely within the last 30 minutes because, um, well, yeah, I, Sorry, um, I think it is in the last 30 minutes. And, um, and the way that um, the autonomous navigation system would work is that the spacecraft is um, on a trajectory based on its orbit around the sun. And, um, and um, it also um, has a pretty good idea of what the orbit of the um, dimorphos around um, Didymos um, is. Um, but uh, because um, you know, a lot of our um, information um, was based on ground-based telescopes where it's extremely difficult to measure the, um, the, the orbit of, of an object that you can't really see from, from the ground. Um, what that means is that um, there will be errors involved in targeting. And so um, as it's approaching, um, there are um, probably algorithms put in place so that, um, you know, obviously you don't want to aim the spacecraft at where um, the um, the moon currently is because um, you want to aim at where it will be. And so um, the software has a model of the orbit and it's using uh, the position of um, DART itself, um, the position of the, um, the moon um, over time um, as it's um, observing it. Um, and it's basically recalculating um, it, its orbit and also um, calculating what sort of changes it needs to make um, in its um, trajectory with its eye on thrusters in order to keep it on track. And so um, you basically um, write um, software that does all of this um, to track it and then to aim it um, to where um, dimorphos um, will be when it impacts. And so in principle, you know, that sounds, um, at least in my explanation, somewhat simple, but I'm sure it's extremely complicated.
Yeah, so a question from the virtual chat. With the Cartwheel Galaxy, what's the time scale for the formation of those uh, cool arms? Yeah, so um, going back to the Cartwheel, that's a great question. Let's see if we can find it. There we go. Um, so collisions of galaxies um, can basically take place on the order of um, tens to hundreds of millions of years. Um, so it can be hundreds of millions of years for um, a galaxy to plunge in um, and plunge out. And the mutual gravity of, of the pair of galaxies will eventually cause the, um, the colliding galaxy to merge with um, the, the larger uh, main galaxy. And so the, that process can take hundreds of millions of years. So, um, but um, the, the actual, you know, depending on how you measure um, when a collision starts to when it um, ends, you know, that um, can probably be on the order of many, um, you know, if we go back to this particular animation, um, you know, when that smaller galaxy is plunging in, it's definitely, um, a lot, you know, what we're seeing here is part of the collision. Let's start that animation again. But you know, how you define the collision, you know, do you um, define it here or do you define it when it's a lot closer, when it's um, just about to touch? Um, and even um, when it's physically, um, when you think about, thinking about um, the boundaries of the galaxies um, touching um, to when they're not touching anymore, um, that um, can be on the order of tens of millions of years. So these are uh, processes that take a long time to, um, to, to happen. And the other amazing thing about collisions like this is that even though we call um, these collisions, at least for the stars, you can expect that not a single star will have actually collided with another star. So the stars are so spread out in galaxies that you don't actually expect um, a star to have a, a very close encounter with another star. And actually, I was meaning to share this, so I apologize for that. So feel free to, um, I can wait for another question while um, we, we watch this animation. So another question from the chat, in that very first simulation you showed, uh, how big did you say that cloud was and what size of stars were forming and like how quickly do they supernova yeah, so uh, let's just go back to that um, animation. So um, for this particular simulation, um, they started off um, with a cloud that um, is about 10 uh, parsecs or about 30 light years across. And uh, it started off with about 20,000 solar masses of stars. And when um, we look out and observe um, star formation, and even when we look out and look at um, stars that have already been born um, in uh, different parts of our galaxy, uh, there tends to be the same proportion of stars that are formed, meaning uh, the less massive, the smaller the star, the more of, of, of them you find. And the more massive a star, the fewer of them you find. And so uh, they use the same sort of statistics in, um, in this particular um, simulation where um, they, um, I think based on first principles as opposed to just in, um, um, adding in kind of an arbitrary or um, you know, artificial population of stars, they, they can actually reproduce um, semi-accurately the, the population of, of stars. Um, and so what you find is um, there tend to be lots of low mass stars, you know, a lot more stars like the mass of our sun and even more stars that are less massive than our sun. And uh, they might only have a handful of stars like um, a couple um, stars that um, are massive enough to put up um, substantial amounts of ultraviolet radiation. And those massive stars also don't live very long. So they might live for a million years or maybe a handful of million of years. And so the um, so you can basically measure in the time of when those massive stars turn on from when um, those um, ionization bubbles first show up so uh, I mentioned early on when we first saw this animation, you saw two um, bubbles expanding outwards. So that's when those uh, two massive stars showed up. And then um, when the supernova uh, of the first star goes off. Um, so that's uh, basically the lifetime of one of those massive stars. And that's probably on the order of a, of a couple million years. All 
All right, so we have someone here who met all three uh, Apollo astronauts um, back in the day. And the question is, where are we going to land on the moon? And when is Artemis going to launch? OK, well, um, I, um, I'm not sure when the um, new um, date for the Artemis launch um, will be. I'm not sure it's been announced just because um, you know they were planning to have it launch this week, uh, but because of Hurricane Ian um, hitting uh, Florida, they decided to roll the rocket back to um, the um, vehicle assembly building. So I, I'm, I'm not sure a new launch date has uh, been announced. And uh, this Artemis, uh, the first Artemis mission is just to send an uncrewed vehicle to go around the moon um, and, um, and to return. So there won't be any uh, people on, bo on board. The second Artemis mission, um, which um, you know, depending on um, how successful successful this mission is and on um, budget funding, um, will take place a few years um, from now, um, and that will send people um, around the moon, but they uh, won't land. Um, and then the third Artemis mission is the one that is supposed to actually land people on the moon. And the current idea is that um, they want to send um, astronauts to the um, surface at the South Pole of the moon. And the reason why is that um, the craters at, at the polar regions are partially or fully um, in, um, in shadow from the sun. And so we think that there actually might be um, water in the form of frozen ice on the moon um, where um, water might have been deposited by asteroids or meteors impacting the moon. And if you're in a place that's permanently shadowed from the sun, that ice can remain buried and um, it might still be there for human use. So if we ever set up a base, uh, we might want to do it on one of the polar regions um, in a sheltered crater where you have access to ice that can be used for water and for um, creating energy out of. All right, thanks so much uh, to all our virtual attendees. Thank you so much, Kachun. There was a round of applause in Rickettson. I don't think you could hear it. Um, but yes, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you can join us next month for the next 60 Minutes in Space. and Have a wonderful evening. All right.